I'd like to begin today's lecture by sharing some quickmeme.com images making fun of professors. In the first one, the professor tells students, I didn't get your papers graded because I teach other classes too. And then separately says, you need to finish your work. I don't care if you have other classes. In this one, the professor says, you drove an hour to get to class in the snow? Well, I decided to cancel class by putting a note outside of the door. <laughs> professors are doinks. Continuing our discussion from our previous lecture, I'd like to teach you more about solubility. Foremost, I want you to remember the cardinal rule of solubility, and that is this, that like dissolves like. What in the world does that mean? Well, what that means is that polar solvents dissolve polar solutes, and nonpolar solvents dissolve nonpolar solutes. For instance, if I take hexane, which is very nonpolar, and dissolve it in water, you'll note that those two liquids are not miscible or soluble in each other. They separate out into two distinct layers. This cardinal rule of solubility, then, that like dissolves like, can be used to predict whether or not certain substances will dissolve or be miscible in each other. All we have to do is ask ourselves, are the two items in question polar or nonpolar? If they're both polar, or if they're both nonpolar, then they will be soluble or miscible. Now, I should note that at this point, you may want to review our rules for determining whether or not something is polar or nonpolar. I'll post a link here to an earlier presentation in which I teach you that. You should also remember that, generally speaking, carbon-hydrogen bonds are basically all nonpolar because carbon and hydrogen are virtually or very, very close to each other in electronegativity. Let's take a look, then, at this example. This molecule shown up here is called cyclohexane, C6H12. All carbons, and each of these uh, points in this six-membered shape, shapey thing represents a carbon atom, and all of these are hydrogens. This molecule is essentially insoluble in water, just like hexane. If I throw it in water, it separates out to form two distinct layers. What happens, though, if I replace some of these hydrogens with OH groups? Well, we see that in this example, glucose. This molecule, glucose, which is one of the simple monosaccharides, is highly soluble in water. Why is glucose, whose structure looks very similar to cyclohexane, so soluble in water while cyclohexane isn't? Well, of course, the answer is polarity. I've got all these polar OH bonds in glucose, whereas in cyclohexane, I don't have any of that. So these polar OH bonds increase the overall polarity of the molecule and thereby allow it to be soluble in polar water. This brings us to some beautiful lecture problems. First, which one of the following substances would be most soluble in carbon tetrachloride, CCl4? To answer this question, we have to determine, is CCl4 polar or nonpolar? I'll post a link here to an earlier video in which I teach you how to determine that. Having done that, and you should realize that it is very nonpolar, we next have to determine which of these potential solutes is the most nonpolar. Whichever one of those solutes is the most nonpolar will be the most soluble in carbon tetrachloride. I'll let you figure out that one on your own. Here's another example. Which of the following substances is most likely to dissolve in benzene, whose formula is C6H6? Is benzene polar or nonpolar? Well, I've got all carbons and hydrogens, virtually little to no dipole. Therefore, this molecule is very nonpolar. So once again, I'm going to now analyze all of these examples and find the one that is the most nonpolar. Which is the correct example? Well, the most nonpolar molecule is carbon tetrachloride, the solvent from our previous example. I now want to show you a cool video from Roger Rabbit in which they discuss benzene. Not because it's relevant to the subject, but just because I like knowing that benzene is enough of a celebrity to appear in a movie that's now probably like 25 or 30 years old. Here goes has been to rein in the insanity, and the only way to do that is to make tools respect the law. How did that gargoyle get to be a judge? Spread a bunch of simoleons around Toontown a couple years back, bought the election. What's that? Remember how I always thought there wasn't a way to kill a tune? Well, Doom found the way. Turpentine, acetone, benzene. He calls it the dip. I'll catch the rabbit, Mr. Valiant. 
Then I'll try him, convict him, and execute him. Here's another problem. The principal reason for the extremely low solubility of sodium chloride in benzene is what? I'll let you read through these possible explanations and see if you can determine the answer on your own. I'm now going to teach you about saturated solutions. You see, when a solvent contains as much solute that a solvent can possibly hold, we call it a saturated solution. You might have experienced this when you use chocolate milk mix. You throw in too much of the chocolate milk mix powder into your milk and stir it up real good. Sometimes you get a bunch of uh, coagulated chocolate mix at the bottom, kind of like a turd at the bottom. The reason is because you have more chocolate milk mix in your solvent, your milk, than that milk can dissolve. So that chocolate milk would be saturated. Now this is going to be freaky. Under certain conditions, it's actually possible to form solutions that contain even more than the maximum amount of dissolved solute. These solutions are called supersaturated solutions. They're really cool because you can add a tiny solute particle called a seed crystal into them, and it will cause the rest of the dissolved solute that's all saturated in that solvent to spontaneously precipitate out. It's really neat, and I'm going to show a video of uh, one such example right here. Now to a new subject. Did you know that gases can actually dissolve in solvents? It's true. For example, carbon dioxide or CO2 dissolves in water to a certain extent. Carbonated drinks contain CO2 dissolved in water. In fact, the CO2 dissolved in your water is what causes it to bubble when you open up a carbonated beverage. And by the way, just so you know, dry ice happens to be solid CO2. And it sublimes, which means it converts directly from a solid to a gas. That's why dry ice is often used to carbonate homemade sodas, such as homemade root beer, which tastes oh so good. So when a gas is dissolved in a liquid with a sealed container, such as this, some gas molecules begin to escape the liquid and fill up the head space, this empty space that's between the surface of the liquid and the container's lid. This process continues until the system reaches a state of equilibrium. Once you reach equilibrium, every time a gas molecule escapes the liquid and goes up into the headspace above it, a corresponding gas molecule has to go from the headspace back down into the liquid. So it's a one-to-one -one exchange, molecule per molecule, once you're at equilibrium. So let me ask you, how do you think the gas pressure above the liquid would be affected if we pushed the piston down? Would the pressure go up? Or would it go down? And secondarily, would pushing the piston down increase or decrease the amount of gas molecules dissolved in the liquid? So in a sealed container, there is a proportional relationship between the gas's pressure and its concentration in solution. This is summarized by the following equation known as Henry's Law. And what do these terms mean, you ask? Well, Sg is the gas's concentration, which is expressed in molarity, which is moles per liter. Pg is the gas's partial pressure over the solution inside the container. And K happens to be a constant that's different for every gas, solvent, and temperature. That brings us to some Henry's Law problems. First, the solubility of nitrogen gas at 25 degrees Celsius in one atmosphere is 6.8 times 10 to the negative fourth moles per liter. If the partial pressure of nitrogen gas in the air is 0.76 atmospheres, what is the concentration molarity of dissolved nitrogen? I invite you to pause the video here, attempt this on your own. I'm going to place a link here to a separate video in which I answer the question if you'd like to watch it. Here's the second question. The concentration of CO2 in a soft drink bottled with a partial pressure of CO2 of 6.5 atmospheres over the liquid at 29 degrees Celsius is this crazy number right here. The Henry's Law constant K for CO2 at this temperature is what? Similarly, I invite you to attempt this on your own. I'll post a link here to a separate video that you're welcome to watch if you'd like in which I answer it and show you how to do it. That brings us to the end of today's lecture. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. I look forward to teaching you more about Chapter 13's coverage of the chemistry of solutes and solvents. Until next time, have an enjoyable rest of your day.